So what I'm going to talk about today is a pretty interesting phenomenon, and that's the fact that when we talk, our hands move. So I'll give you a second to think about that. Why? When we use our mouths for other things, when we breathe, when we eat, we don't wave our hands along with our mouths. Those are kind of the main three things we do with our mouths, but somehow talking brings along hand movement for free. We don't have to think about it. We don't have to plan it. It just comes. And I think that's an interesting observation about human behavior. It turns out that gesture is a really robust characteristic of people communicating. So if you look at young babies, they start gesturing really early. Before they say their first words, babies are pointing to things in their world. It turns out if you look at individuals who are blind, so individuals who've never seen another person produce a gesture, they gesture when they talk. And they gesture when they're talking to other blind listeners. So if you thought I figured this out, the reason we gesture is for the other person in the interaction, it's kind of hard to explain those gestures because clearly blind listeners aren't extracting information from the gestures produced by their blind or sighted communication partners. There's even an isolated report in the literature <coughs> of a woman who was born congenitally without arms. Now, it's hard to know what to make of this data, but she reports that when she talks, her hands move too. Interestingly, when she does other things like walk around, her hands that she imagines don't move. They only move when she's talking to other people. So whether or not you want to take that data as convincing, I think it's quite clear that gesture is a really rich feature of human behavior. It's something that we all do. We do without thinking. And so we have a simple question. Why do we do it? So before I go into my answer for the question of why we gesture, I want to give you a little bit of a, a taste of what gesture looks like. And I know you're all going to be looking at my gestures because that's what happens when I get up here and talk about gesture. But it's kind of nice if we have somebody else to look at rather than just me. So this is Professor Richard Feynman, who's a Nobel winning physicist. And he's just going to talk a little bit. He was very renowned for his teaching ability, his ability to communicate. And he's also a very nice gesture. You hold out a flower and say, look how beautiful it is. And I agree. And he says, see that I and ask and see how beautiful this is. But you as a scientist, oh, take us all apart and become a dull thing. And I think that he's kind of nutty. First of all, the beauty that he sees is available to other people and to me too. I believe <coughs> I'm quite as inclined and aesthetically as he is. And I can't appreciate the beauty of the flower. At the same time, I see much more about the flower than you see. I can imagine the cells in there, the complicated actions. I mean, it's also not a beauty. I mean, it's not just beauty at this dimension, one centimeter. There's also beauty at smaller dimensions. The inner structure, also the processes. The fact that the colors of the flower evolve in order to attract insects to pollinate it is interesting. It means that insects can see the color. It adds a question. Does this aesthetic sense also exist in the law of forms? Does it, why is it aesthetic? All kinds of interesting questions. So I'm going to try and take the same approach to the study of gesture. Start to think about why, why do we gesture? What is the beauty in gesture? If we look at gesture at a slightly more fine-grained level, what do we see? And I'm going to answer the question of why we gesture with one explanation, and that's a functional explanation. So if we want to answer the question of why something happens, there's kind of two approaches you can take. One approach is to identify the cognitive mechanisms that lead to the behavior. So that is, what is the case by which speech production involves hand movement? The second explanation for a behavior asks, what's the function of the behavior? And that's the approach that I'm going to take. I'm going to argue that gestures are functional, both for speakers and listeners, and that they function in some surprising ways. So we know that you don't need gestures to communicate. You can talk quite reliably just with speech. If I played the video, or the video that I just played without any video, with just audio, you all would have understood what he was communicating. We can talk on the phone, we write letters. But it turns out that even in, uh, uh, <laughs> we're very good at taking words coming into our brains and linking them up with objects in the, in the, in the wild. So, if you look at a classic study in human communication, Mike Tannenhaus's visual world studies, where they're eye-tracking listeners as they hear speech, you find that listeners, almost as quickly as possible after they hear a beginning of a word, are able to move their eyes 
to the appropriate reference in the environment. So in this case, listeners are seated looking at that grid where there's both a beaker and a beetle. And if they hear, click at the beetle. As soon as they start to hear the buh sound, they're already narrowing in on the beaker and the beetle. As the E comes in, they look between. And as soon as they hear the appropriate consonant, they get their eyes to the right object. We know how to listen to speech, and we know how to link it to our environment. But even when we're doing very simple tasks, we bring in the body. So my favorite example of this is when you ask people to sit in front of a computer screen and to name pictures. A very simple task. We're all very good at this. You can get very small children to do this task. It turns out people spontaneously point at the pictures while they name them without being asked to do so. And I think this demonstrates in a really simple behavior how rich gesture is, how pervasive, how frequent, and how common. So what I want to argue today is that hand gesture really reveals the embodiment of communication. It suggests that we're communicating not just with these words that are removed from time and place, but we're communicating with our bodies that exist in a particular time and place. And we're communicating to another body that exists in that same time and place. And between those two bodies, information flows. <clears throat> so I want to stop by highlight the richness of the term by highlighting the richness of the term embodied cognition. So Margaret Wilson wrote a very famous paper in 2002 describing six different aspects of behavior that meet the criteria in the literature for people calling it embodied. She talked about cognition as situated, time pressured, being offloaded onto the environment, the environment being incorporated into the cognitive system, cognition being for action and cognition being body-based. And if you look through this list, it's quite clear that gesture meets all of these criteria. It's a fundamentally embodied behavior. If we zero in and look at speech and gesture, we find that there are two behaviors that are tightly coupled and that work together. So first of all, they're produced by a single speaker in a single moment. Right? I speak and gesture. Somebody can't gesture for me. It just doesn't work. They communicate a single idea. So if you look across speech and gesture, you can come up with some framework that links those two ideas. Even in cases where speech and gesture seem to communicate kind of different aspects, you can fit it under some communicative umbrella. They work together, but they encode information in two different ways. Gesture encodes information using the body, whereas words, speech, communicates information using abstract categories. Now, what I want to argue is that gesture, this bodily communication, matters. So the first point I want to make is that speakers use gesture to communicate bodily information, that I can communicate information about how bodies act in the world using my hand gestures. Now, I'm going to do this with a really simple task. So this task is the Tower of Hanoi. It's a classic cognitive problem-solving uh, task. People have studied this task for a long time. The goal is very simple. You have a tower of disks, and you need to move them from the left peg to the right peg. There are two rules about how you can move the disc. You can only move one disc at a time, and you can't place a larger disc on top of a smaller disc. And I was interested in how people would communicate information about how to move the disc when they were talking about this task. Because when we act in the world, it's our bodies that do the how, right? They actually move the disc from place to place. So what we manipulated was this, the manner in which the disc could be moved. One group of speakers solved the Tower of Hanoi with real objects, so a wooden board and heavy weights like at the gym that they had to lift from peg to peg. A second group of speakers solved the exact same task, but they did it on the computer. So they had a mouse, they clicked on the disks, and they dragged them from place to place. In the computer version, you didn't even have to actually lift up the disks. As soon as you clicked on one, you could slide it over sideways to the other disk, or to the other um, peg. So the way our experiment worked, the speaker comes in and learns how to solve the Tower of Hanoi using either real objects or the computer. Um, they then explain to a listener how to solve that problem. So they have this experience. They go explain it. They communicate it to someone else. And then we have the listener go and solve the Tower of Hanoi. So we can get a measure from the listener of what they extracted from the speaker's explanation. And our listener always solved on the computer. And that was so we had a fine-grained measure of what the listener thought about how to move the disk. On the computer, you can move the disk in all sorts of ways. In the real world, you have to follow the affordances of objects. You can't just slide disks off pegs without lifting them up. So we thought that the computer might be a richer measure of listener behavior. So the first question we can ask is, what do speakers tell their listeners? 
And they tell them something very simple. They tell them where the disks go. They provide an extensive sequence of the locations of movement of each of the disks in the problem that listeners need to follow to solve the task. This is an example from a speaker. It's not very easy to follow, and our listeners are often pretty confused by this. But you'll notice they don't say anything about how to move the disk. And of course, they don't need to. We are people who act in the world, and we know how to do things, right? I don't have to tell you how to click and drag on a computer unless you're my you know, ancient grandmother who's never seen one. You know what to do. So one more point about the verbal descriptions. We analyzed them extensively in a variety of ways, and we couldn't find any differences in what people said as a function of how they solved the Tower of Hanoi. So next, we took a look at their gestures. What do speakers do with their hands? It turns out their hands depict really rich information about how to move the disk. So in the computer condition, people use one-handed gestures with pointing hand shapes that have low, flat trajectories. In the real objects condition, people use two hands, which is interesting already, right? They're moving space. This is not heavy. I do not need two hands to move from place to place, but I imagine those heavy weights that did require two hands to lift, and I suddenly gesture with both my hands. They produced higher trajectories, and they had grasping hand shapes as if they were holding objects. So that's interesting, right? Speakers' perceptual motor experience influences their gesture. Maybe not too surprising, we can use our hands to represent what our hands do. So what happens to the listeners in this task? Are their bodies influenced by the gestures that they saw during communication? And the way we're going to do this is we're going to look at the mouse movements that they produced when they solved the Tower of Hanoi. And so what I'm going to depict next is the average mouse movement trajectory produced by the listeners in this task as a function of how their speaker learned to solve the Tower of Hanoi. I'm asking, is this bodily experience being transmitted? And the answer, of course, is yes. So the red curve is the listeners of speakers who have learned to solve with real objects. The blue curve is the listeners of speakers who have learned to solve on the computer. And you can see that if your speaker lifted objects from place to place, you sit down at the computer and lift the disc from place to place, even though you don't need to. If your speaker dragged the disc from place to place, you sit down at the computer and drag the disc from place to place. And I want to point out that this is happening entirely under the radar of awareness. No listener reported extracting information from the gestures. They didn't report knowledge of, that the speaker might have had a different experience. This just happened in the flow of normal communication. A little bit more convincing evidence that this really came from the gestures that listeners observed. We looked at the average trajectory that a listener observed and how that related to the average, or yeah, the average trajectory that a listener observed and how that related to the average trajectory that they produced when they solved the task. And you see here, there's a nice correlation. If you saw gestures with higher trajectories, you produced mouse movements with higher trajectories. <coughs> So listeners are extracting information from the gestures that they see, and they're using this information to guide their own behavior. And of course, that's what we all need to do all the time, is act in the world, do things. We don't know the people around us are giving us useful information about how to do things in the world all the time. And we just pick that up and act on it without being aware of it. So I think the answer to the question, do speakers use gesture to communicate bodily information, is clearly yes. So I think this also shows the complementary encoding across these two modalities. And I think this is a really nice feature of cognition in general. We often use multiple ways of encoding the same information as kind of synergistically to enhance our cognition. Interaction between multiple ways of representing information can provide fodder for cognition to move forward, I believe. If speech and gesture are truly complementary modes of representing information, then we should see tight interactions between how information is re represented in one modality and what happens in the other. And what I want to do next is argue that there is in fact a trade-off. When you put more information in gesture, that influences the information you put in speech. And I would argue the other way as well, although I'm not going to present data that goes the other way. So what I want to do next is ask whether or not speakers trade information off between the visual and auditory mo modality during communication. Um, so this study is going to look at speech along with pointing gesture. And the idea is that when I produce a pointing gesture, when I point at something, you already know what I'm going to say. Pen, right? 
So the speech doesn't need to tell you very much information. If I want to talk about the pen without pointing, I have to give you a really good signal because I could talk about anything in the room or even out of the room. And in the context of speech alone, Phil Lieberman in the 60s demonstrated very nicely that when listeners already know what a speaker is going to say, speakers produce that thing less clearly. So in this study, he looked at how speakers articulated the word nine when they were asked to say, a stitch in time saves nine, which is an idiom in English meaning you, if you um, are careful with what you do, you'll save time later. Versus the party is at nine. And when you say a stitch in time saves, you have to say nine. There's no other word you can put in there that makes sense. Versus when you say the party is at, there can be parties at any time of day or night, depending on what you and your friends like to do. And so you need to be sure that you communicate the correct time. And what Phil Lieberman showed is that if you t excise those nines out of those sentences and play them back to other listeners, they have a lot easier time identifying the nines that came from the party is at nine than the nines that came at from a stitch in time saves nine because they're less well articulated. We're going to ask the same thing, but across speech and gesture. So the way we did this is we had speakers and listeners come into the lab. They were seated in front of a horizontal touch screen, and there were four pictures arranged on the touch screen. Um, they might be something like this, a back, a pack, a beach, and a peach. So they've already learned the names, so we know that they're going to use the right words. And you probably noticed something as I was naming these pictures. They're minimal pairs. Back and pack differ only in the initial consonant. It's a B or a P. And we know from a lot of research and speech what the difference between B and P is. So there's a couple of cues, but the main one is voice onset time, how you use your voice as you start the word. And so what we want to know is how do speakers produce those Bs and Ps as a function of whether they're pointing or not at the back and pack. So it's really simple. The speaker comes in we, over headphones. We tell them which picture to refer, or to refer to. And they say things like beach without pointing or back along with a point to the back. And they do have a listener. Oh, so the manipulation is that the speaker either points or not along with their speech. Um, and we don't tell them what to say. So we tell them to point at and name the picture in the upper right or name the picture in the upper right. And that's so it's a real articulation. They're not just copying how we produce the B or the P. They're articulating it on their own. They do have a listener, so this is actually a communicative task. They're not just speaking to the microphone or the experimenter. A listener is sitting there, and the listener is actually acting on this information. So the listener is just is doing a two-back memory task, which is pretty simple. As each word comes in, they're saying, is it the same as the word that I heard two previously? If it's the same, they say yes. If not, they say no. The listeners are very good at this. They're basically at 95%. We tried to make it a little harder for them, but then they really didn't like it. It was very difficult. And so we weren't so interested in the listener in this study, we left it easy for them. So what we're going to do is we're going to go in and analyze the acoustic properties of the speech that's produced and ask whether or not that speech is influenced by coming along with a pointing gesture. And our prediction is that when you point to objects in the world, that should be associated with speech that's less informative, that's less <coughs> clearly articulated. So we're going to look at two measures. We're going to look at syllable length and voice onset time. Syllable length is kind of an important control because your voicing changes as a function of how long your syllable is. So if syllable length shows the same pattern, then the voicing data are going to be harder to interpret. But luckily, that's not what we found. In fact, we found that in both cases, speakers talked. And when they were articulating Bs and Ps, speakers talked more quickly when they gestured versus when they didn't, already suggesting that the speech that comes along with gesture might be less clear. So what I have here on the x-axis is the consonant that's being articulated, a B or a P. Um, the two different colors are the different trial types. So the orange is naming trials when you're just naming. The greenish turquoise is pointing trials when you're pointing. And in both cases, it's a small difference, but actually reliable because we needed a lot of trials in this study. Speakers are, producing, are speaking more quickly when they point versus when they name. But this is true for both Bs and Ps, which means that any change in voicing that's different across those two, and we expect opposite changes, can't be attributed to the speed of speaking. So what we want to do next is go in and look at how good are those Bs and Ps? What does the voicing look like? So what I have here is a uh, depiction of a histogram of the frequency of various amounts of voicing. And this is for the B trials. And the way voicing works is lower amounts of voicing means you're more likely to hear it as a B. 
Larger amounts of voicing mean that you're more likely to hear it as a P. And what you can see is the green distribution is slightly shifted towards the P's. The B's that are produced along with pointing are more like P's than the B's that are produced along with naming. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, it is significant. It's a very small difference. You expect this in voice onset time. Right? The nice thing, I mean, the, the, the thing I like about this data is my speech collaborator never thought that this would work, that you don't see these sorts of changes in speech in a whole lot of other contexts in which you might expect them. So um, they're kind of surprising from that perspective. We see the opposite effect in the P's. So the P's that are produced along with voicing don't shift to larger voice onset time. Instead, they shift back towards the B's. They, again, are less clear. They're more like B's than the P's that are produced without pointing. So what this suggests is that the most fine-grained measures that we can measure the information that speakers are giving to their listeners, producing a gesture along with that speech matters. Speech and gesture are clearly tightly integrated, not just at the conceptual level, but all the way down to the phonetic level. The information that I'm giving you millisecond to millisecond as I communicate depends on whether or not I'm moving my hands along with producing that speech. So what I've argued thus far is, first of all, that we can see two different types of encoding of information, and second of all, that speakers distribute information across these two ways of communicating. What I want to ask next is how flexibly do speakers use gesture? So it turns, if gesture is truly an important channel of communication and it doesn't just come along for, or doesn't just kind of get produced out of the speech, but we can use it, we should be able to use it flexibly. That is to say, one explanation for how we produce gesture is that we talk and as a function of what we say, our gestures get produced. What I'm arguing is something different, that speakers are adapting the two modalities to one another and putting information in one place that, has influ that influences the other. So it's not kind of the speech-centric model of communication, it's dynamic between the two modalities. And if this is true, we need to see evidence that people are using gesture flexibly, that I can say the same thing in two different situations and I gesture differently. If I say the same thing and I always gesture the same way, that would suggest that really it's speech that's important and gesture is emerging from that speech. To the extent that speech and gesture both change, then that would suggest that these two modalities are interacting in a much more dynamic way. And we already know that we don't say the same thing all the time, that speech is flexible across situations. The question is, is gesture also flexible across situations? But I'm going to argue that if people can use gesture flexibly, then we should see evidence of gesture changing as a function of the context in which it's produced. And I'm going to describe two studies that show that speakers are using gesture flexibly. <coughs> So the context that I'm going to look at is whether or not, or is who I'm talking to. Do I gesture differently for different listeners, even if I'm trying to communicate the same thing? So I'm going to again use a similar idea to the study that I just told you about. And this is the idea that your gestures should be less informative if your listener has more knowledge. So in this case, if your listener has more knowledge, they should kind of following the lines of the previous study, also be able to predict more about what you're saying and understand it more readily. And so you should give them less rich information and gesture. If your listener doesn't have very good knowledge, you should give them the information that they need, and in some cases that might be gestured information. So I'm going to do this using the Tower of Hanoi task. Um, and what we're going to do is we're going to set up a situation where speakers are communicating to different kinds of listeners. Some listeners have useful knowledge, and some listeners have less useful knowledge. So the way this works is speaker and listener pairs come into the lab. They sit down at the computer and the speaker learns how to solve the Tower of Hanoi with three disks. Then the listener leaves and the speaker learns how to solve the Tower of Hanoi with four disks, which is actually a much harder task. I mean, <coughs> it's harder in that it requires more moves. Conceptually, it's kind of the same, but they think it's harder. Then the speaker explains to the listener how to solve that four disk task. What we're going to do is we're going to manipulate information that the listener has that we expect the speaker to communicate in gesture. So what do we expect the speaker to communicate in gesture? You guys already know the answer. We expect them to know to communicate how to move the disc from place to place using their hands. And so what we're going to manipulate is listener knowledge about how to move the disc from place to place. So for one group, whoops, um, 
the listeners are going to have knowledge about lifting, and for the other group, the listeners are going to have knowledge about dragging. And what lifting means is that you're required to lift the disc up off the peg before you can move it sideways. So even though you're on the computer, it's acting like real objects. You can't just slide it right off like you could in the previous computer version that I told you about. So the way this works, for one group, what we're going to call the common ground condition, where the listener has useful information, the speaker and listener both see lifting in the three-disc tower of Hanoi, then the speaker learns with lifting, and they then explain lifting to the listener. In the uncommon ground condition, we're just going to change this first little experience. So when the speakers and listeners sit down together, the speaker can drag the disc, and the listener is just observing this. Then the listener leaves, and the speaker has to solve the Tower of Hanoi with lifting, and they then go explain that lifting for a solution to their listener. So in this case, the listener has kind of the wrong idea about how to move the disc. If the speakers are keeping track of that shared experience, the listener probably assumes that you can just drag in the four disc version just like the three disc. If speakers are being helpful to their listeners, they might want to give them a little bit of extra information about how to move those discs from place to place. Of course, it's really easy to do this. I could just say, you need to lift the disc. But we don't expect this how information to come out in speech. Although, to be fair, we were a little bit nervous when we ran this study that speakers might just say that, making the gestures not very interesting. But we went ahead and ran the study interesting, uh, anyway, and what we found was, first of all, that speakers didn't tell their listeners what to do. So no speaker ever said anything about lifting. We analyzed the speech across the two conditions, and we couldn't find any evidence of kind of information about how to move the discs in speech anywhere in our study. Even though it's a very easy thing to communicate, people, for whatever reason, thought that this was a little irrelevant. They didn't communicate. When we looked at the gesture, speakers didn't change the exact form of the gestures they used. They didn't change the rate at which they gestured or the average trajectory that they depicted. But they did change where in space those gestures were produced. So in the common ground condition, they gestured down low. In the uncommon ground condition, when the listener had the wrong information about where to move the disc, they raised their gestures up in space and produced them near their face. And we know from follow-up work that listeners actually get more information from gestures that are produced higher in space. So if I think you have the wrong information about how to do something in the world, I give you gestures that give you more information. I put my gestures in a place where you're likely to get information from them. Of course, there's a little bit of a problem with this study that maybe some of you really sharp people out there have noticed, or maybe all of you are really sharp and have noticed, and that's that it might not be about the listener at all. Maybe when I change how you move the discs, that's just more interesting to you, and so you produce these higher gestures. So we ran a control study that was exactly the same as the study I just told you about, but the listener was never there. So if it's just about the speaker's experience, then we should see the same difference in this study. If instead it's about the listener, it should matter with whether the listener was there or not. And what we found, in this case, the listener has no information about how to move the discs, and speakers give them nice high gestures where the listeners are likely to extract that information from their gestures. So what these findings show is that gesture doesn't just reflect what we're saying. Instead, it, we use it flexibly to target it to the listeners. We adjust what we're going to say as a function of who we're talking to, and we also adjust how we're going to gesture as a function of who we're talking to. And those changes in gesture don't just come about because we change our speech, because in this study, speech didn't change at all. Instead, when information is in the gesture channel, this manner information, this how information, it gets modulated for listeners that need that specific information. So speech and gesture are being dynamically deployed in the moment for specific listeners. So are speakers gesturing for their listeners? The answer is pretty clear. Yes, I think they are. But you'll notice in that study, we didn't see a lot of changes in how they gestured. We saw changes in where the gestures were located. So we wanted to probe a little bit further and ask whether or not speakers actually adjust the content of their gesture for specific listeners. And to do this, we turned to a different task. What we did was we looked at cases where speakers might think information is more or less important for their listener. 
And of course, to modulate the importance of information in the lab is actually pretty difficult to do, right? We bring in these undergraduates. They don't really care about our experiments. They know that the communication probably isn't that important at all. Um, and getting changes in that are probably going to be fairly difficult. But we took advantage of some work going on in the neighboring lab where they were investigating mother-child communication about safety to answer this question because we thought that mothers communicating with their children about how safe things are is a pretty important aspect of communication. Parents have a vested interest in keeping their children safe. Turns out that injury is a very leading cause of death of kids across the world. Parents need to do the best they can to keep their kids safe. So we thought that these parents might be particularly motivated to communicate to their kids. And we might see changes in their gesture as a function of whether or not they thought information was important for their individual children. So the idea is that when moms think something is unsafe and their kids think it's safe, moms should be particularly motivated to communicate that information to their children. So in the task that I'm going to tell you about, um, moms and kids came into the lab and they discussed pictures of children engaged in borderline unsafe activities. So first, the moms and kids separately said how safe or unsafe they thought these activities were. So they just rated on a Likert scale from one to four whether these activities were very safe, kind of safe, kind of unsafe, or unsafe. And they did this independently. And this is really nice because that means we know what the speaker and listener thought about how safe these activities were independent of their conversation about these two things. Then moms and kids came into the lab together. They sat down in front of that same computer screen and they were asked to discuss the situation and agree on a joint rating. What we were interested in is mother's communication during that joint phase. Let me get a drink. So it turns out if you look at what moms do, they talk about two characteristics of the situation. They talk about features of the situation. So those are things that can be directly observed in the picture. He's up high on the slide. He's not wearing a helmet. The burner is on. And they talk about outcomes, things that you can't see in the situation, but that could happen. You might fall from the slide. You might burn yourself. You might cut yourself. And they do this, and they talk about features and outcomes that are both dangerous and non-dangerous. So a dangerous feature is something that could lead to pain could lead to a dangerous outcome. A non-dangerous feature is a characteristic of the situation that's not relevant to how dangerous it is. And they did so in both speech and gesture. So here you an example of a mom talking about the hot burner and she's also pointing right at that hot burner. And so what we were interested in is how mothers adjusted their gestures as a function of whether or not their listeners needed the information that they were going to communicate. And the idea is really simple. When a mom thinks something is dangerous and her child thinks it's safe, mom should be really motivated to communicate about danger. That's the information that the child needs, right? The child thinks it's safe, but actually, according to mom, it's dangerous. The opposite is also true. When a mom thinks something is safe, but her child thinks it's dangerous, of course, we don't want our kids to you know, run around scared of everything. We need to inform them that, in fact, this isn't such a dangerous situation. Look, these features make the situation safe. And so what we expected is that when moms think situations are dangerous and kids think it's safe, moms should gesture more about danger. And when moms think situations are safe but kids think they're dangerous, moms should gesture more about non-danger. When they both think it's unsafe or, they both, or the opposite is true, we should see the opposite. So hopefully that made sense. Um, so what I'm going to do next is display the results and it's kind of complicated because we have features, outcomes, dangerous, non-dangerous, moms gesturing, what moms think. So I'll try to break it down for you. If you don't get it, please raise your hand and ask a question and I'll try to explain it another way. But essentially we found what we thought we were going to find. So it's not that hard to get, I don't think. So what we have here on the top row is dangerous features and dangerous outcomes. The bottom row, non-dangerous features, non-dangerous outcomes. So we expect opposite patterns. For kids that think safe, mom should talk about dangerous. For kids that think danger, mom should talk about safety. But of course, it should matter what mom thinks as well. And so on the x-axis, we have the disparity between the two. And it's coded as mom, the higher the number, the more the mom thinks it's dangerous, and the more the child thinks it's safe. So it's mom rating minus child rating. So the three, the far right side, is when mom should be motivated to communicate about danger. 
the negative three is when mom should be motivated to communicate about safety on our analysis. And what we're going to do is we're going to predict the likelihood that the mom gestures about these things given that she's already saying them in her speech. And so this means we're not saying, do moms talk about different things? We're saying, do I switch my gesture even though I'm talking about the same thing? And that's important, right? Because that means that we're really flexibly using our gesture as opposed to talking about different things. We already know that moms are going to talk about different things in these cases. So in the case where mom already is talking about a dangerous feature, how likely is she to produce a gesture along with that dangerous feature? So it's not changes in what they say, it's changes in when they produce their gestures. And what we find is exactly what we predict. So, and the solid bars are when mom talks about dangerous features once in her speech. The dash bars are when she talks about dangerous features twice in her speech, or dangerous outcomes, non-dangerous features, non-dangerous outcomes. So of course we expect more gesture as she talks about it more in her speech. And in fact, the effect gets more exaggerated the more moms talk. So if we just look at dangerous features, what we see is as the child thinks the situation is more safe and the mom thinks it's more dangerous, the mom becomes more likely to gesture along with her dangerous features. The same is true, even more extreme, for dangerous outcomes. As the child thinks the situation is safe and mom thinks it's more dangerous, the mom gestures more for the dangerous outcomes. The opposite is true for non-dangerous features, so I like to think about it kind of moving that way. As the child thinks it's more dangerous but the mom thinks it's more safe, the mom gestures more about non-dangerous features and non-dangerous outcomes, although non-dangerous outcomes were pretty rare and were not significant. Uh -huh. so, clarification, the, uh, so is the assumption that the mother knows that this disparity? That yes, the mom does know the disparity because they start off almost every interaction with the mom saying, what did you think about this one? And the kid says, I thought this was very safe. And then this only includes the trials where the child has already said what they think. Before before this, yes. The, and thank you for that. That's actually a really important point. They, of course, don't magically know what's in each other's minds. The kids have verbally stated what they think. And in fact, this disparity is actually calculated as the disparity between what the child says and what the mom thought prior to the interaction. Great question. Thank you. So what we see is that in an important communicative domain, moms are using their gesture to cue their kids into where the important information is. If I think information is particularly relevant to you, I'm going to gesture along with that information, giving you another channel for recognizing that information and giving you kind of an extra cue that what I'm saying along with these gestures is probably important for you. And that's why I'm gesturing all the time, because I think it's all important. <laughs> So if we go back to our thinking about speak and gest speech and gesture, what I hope I've convinced you at this point is that speakers are flexibly using their gesture as a function of who they're talking to, and they're modulating it as a function of how important the information is that they're communicating. So we use our gestures to communicate information that doesn't come out in our speech. We do so in a way that influences how we talk, and we do so flexibly for our listeners. What I want to do next is turn to those listeners and ask, what are listeners doing? How are they extracting information? And what are they sensitive to? And the question I'm going to ask is a really simple one. Are listeners uniquely sensitive to gesture? Or are they sensitive to something else? It turns out that a whole host of nonverbal behaviors co-occur with gesture. We change where we're going to look. We change the prosody of our speech. We change the timing of various behaviors as a function of whether we gesture or not. It's certainly possible that when we think listeners are sensitive to gesture, they're actually sensitive to something else. And on an embodied account, gesture should be special, right? It's produced by our bodies, and it should have some unique qualities. But we know from a lot of work on visual auditory integration that visual and auditory information that comes together engages our minds in all sorts of ways. Gesture may just be kind of parasitic on that visual auditory integration. On that account, there's not anything special about gesture. It just happens to be a really useful synchronized signal. <coughs> One more drink of water. So I'm going to tell you about two different lines of work that try to address this question of what our listeners are sensitive to. And the first is maybe a little bit of a side note, but I thought it would be interesting to this audience. And this is some work I'm doing with a gesturing avatar. And why I like the avatar is because you can perfectly control everything, which is really hard to do with human actors. 
So we're going to use our avatar to control all the nonverbal behavior that typically co-occurs with gesture. In this study, we're looking at kids learning math. I have a whole line of work that I'm not talking about very much today, but that shows how gesture is really helpful for math learning. So I'll show you what these videos look like. Kids are going to see a gesturing avatar and, or a non-gesturing avatar, and everything else, all the gaze, posture shifts, are exactly the same. Easier to look at than to talk about. <laughs> So we have the gesturing guy and the non-gesturing guy, and otherwise they're the same. So the question is, do kids learn more? Whoops, I gotta stop both the videos. There we go. The question is, do children learn more as a function of this gesture, or do just the postural shifts in eye gaze, is that enough to influence learning? In fact, what you find, not too surprising, kids learn more when they see it, learn from an avatar that gestures along with its speech. So this, I don't think, is that surprising of a finding. It's nice. What it does is validate that the avatar works like a normal human gesture. We now can go in and vary more subtle things about the avatar and how it speaks and gestures and use it as a nice controlled platform for investigating this behavior that's really hard for humans to control in the moment. So that was my little side note, relevant for all of the computer scientists out there. Now I'll do next is continue with this question of what is it that listeners are sensitive to when they're sensitive to, question, to gesture. And I'm going to pit two things against one another. The first is hands and bodies. They're really sensitive to the fact that this information is represented with the human body. The second is temporal coordination. That what they're sensitive to is the fact that these hands move along with speech and they move in perfect temporal synchrony. And gesture researchers for a long time have been really fascinated by the precise timing of gesture with respect to speech. You may notice, um, I could have drawn your attention to it a little bit more, but that speakers get their hands ready before they're going to say something that a gesture goes along with so that when they say it, they can execute that gesture right at the same time. Turns out that gestures anticipate speech by a couple hundred milliseconds. So my hand starts moving before the speech that seems to go along with it comes out. But that 200 milliseconds is quite reliable. So these things are perfectly coordinated as I keep talking. And so it's possible that what listeners are sensitive to is that perfect coordination. So of course, to ask this question, what we need is a synchronous signal that's not a hand. If it's hands that matter, Listeners should only be sensitive to hands that are synchronous with speech. If instead it's synchrony that matters, listeners should be sensitive to any perfectly synchronous signal. So the way we did this is we utilized some bouncing balls to replace moving hands, and the bouncing balls were synchronous with the speech just in the way the hands were. So we're going to go back to the Tower of Hanoi, and we're going to ask whether listeners, looking at a video of someone explaining how to solve the Tower of Hanoi, are influenced only by a video that includes hands, or also influenced by a video that includes balls moving exactly where the hands are moving. So the way we did this is we w took our gesturing video, we went in on each frame of the video, and we marked the location of the left and right hand, and we now have, we replaced th those locations with a red and a blue ball, and then we take away the video. So we now have a red and blue ball that moves around frame by frame, just like the hands move around in the actual video. And then we're going to take these stimuli and play them to listeners. Some listeners are only going to hear the audio. Some listeners are going to hear the audio along with these two bouncing balls. So no hands, but a perfectly synchronous signal to the extent that gesture is perfectly synchronous. We made this a little bit harder for some listeners. They're going to see two bouncing balls that go along with speech, along with four bouncing balls that come from other speakers and don't match the speech. And that's because if it's synchrony, then asynchronous cues shouldn't distract you. And then some people are going to get the full video, so the hands moving along with the speech. Now, I'll give you an idea of what this looks like. What you're going to see next is a video of the explanation for the Tower of Hanoi that we used. It's going to start with just the audio, and then you'll see the balls moving until you get to the gestures. So we'll start off with video, then you'll see all three bouncing balls, then we'll zero in on just those two that go with hands, and then you'll see the hands. Then you move 
Gnostics or the end. And you the Gnostics in the middle or the bottom end. And you move the third disc to the middle. And you move the smallest one over to the starting point on how the watch is And then you move the second smallest disc over to the middle. And you move the smallest disc that's over here up to the middle again. So you have three of them and then you have the one right there. So you move that one all the way to the end. And then you put the you take the smallest disc and you put it on the one on the end. And then you take the um, second smallest one and put it to the one at the beginning. And then you take the very smallest one and put it on that one at the beginning. So then you have like two one and one. And so then you put the um, the one that's in the middle and put the last one. Then you put you can place your bets now as to your own experience. Do you think those balls communicated trajectory information? Did it matter that it was a human producer? Or does any synchronous visual information engage that same processing mechanism? Of course, these are the kind of studies that you love to run because you aren't really sure how it's going to turn out and you're going to find out something interesting either way. What I'll do next is show you the results. So what I'm, be, what I'm depicting here is the average mouse trajectory produced by listeners in each of those four conditions. We'll start with the lowest one, the kind of turquoise one. That's the audio alone condition. So if you don't see visual information, you just slide the discs over. The video is actually the purple line. So if you get the hands along with speech, you reliably produce curved trajectories. That's nice. That's a replication of what we already knew but this time we've moved it to video. You don't have to see those gestures live to have them influence your behavior. So what about the balls? Well, the orangish reddish condition is when you see those two balls moving along with speech. And you'll notice you seem to get even more information from the gestures when there's not a person there. And we think that's because when there's a person there, we tend to look at the face and we're processing the gestures in the periphery. When there's no face there, you're paying attention to this synchronous signal and you get a lot of information from it. Um, and then the greenish is the multiple balls, which is not reliably different from the video. So even when we've added in these noise balls, you still seem to zero in on the ones that are synchronous with speech and extract the information from them. So are listeners sensitive to bodies? Not quite. What they seem to be sensitive to is this exquisite temporal synchrony between movement and auditory information. I think I already said that. One really nice thing about this study that I think is quite fascinating is that the listeners in our study didn't have the subjective experience of those balls as hand gestures. They all reported I ignored the balls, they were distracting, I didn't pay attention to them, I didn't get any information from them, so we asked them a lot of detailed questions after the study. They didn't have the same subjective experience, but they still got that information from the signal. You guys are a little bit of an unfair audience, right, because you've been cued to think about gesture and to see them a little bit as gestures. And I even kind of feel like I see arms behind those balls when I watch them move. But if you don't know what you're seeing, you perceive it a little bit differently. So we then asked, well, is it really synchrony? Or does synchrony just kind of help? And the way we decided to ask this question was asked, what if you get a really reliable visual signal, but it's not synchronous? So those bouncing balls are noisy, right? The hands jitter when you're not talking. Sometimes they're, they're both of them moving together because those were those two-handed gestures I was telling you about. But other times, it's a little bit less clear. And so maybe the speakers kind of, um, maybe listeners would be influenced by any visual signal as long as it were rich enough or robust enough that the information was there. And in this case, it's not really synchrony, although synchrony helps, but in fact is any visual signal that comes along with speech. So the way we tested this was by giving people a really reliable bouncing ball. So one group of participants was in whoops, what we call the I think this is high bounce condition, where the entire time they're listening to the explanation, they just watch this ball move high, high, high. And you just watch that as you listen to the speech. A second group was in the low bounce condition. So you just see this ball, it's moved slightly curved. That's like those ge gestures in the computer condition. And the whole time you watch this low trajectory. <coughs> and so our thought was that if you integrate anything with speech, then you should show differences in mouse trajectory as a function of whether you saw this real curved trajectory or this more flat trajectory. 
If instead it's really synchrony that matters, then even though you're watching this ball for the entire minute of the explanation, that should be irrelevant to the Tower of Hanoi. It didn't really go along with that speech. It was just an irrelevant visual signal. So if synchrony is really important, then we shouldn't see a difference in this case. If instead robust visual signals get integrated with speech, we should see a difference as a function of what you saw. And in fact, this looks like a difference. The scale is a little bit off. There's no difference between these two conditions. And if anything, the low bounce, the flatter one, is producing more curved trajectories than the high bounce, the more curved one. Um, and we're adding in a straight line condition to see what happens when the ball moves perfectly straight. And so far, it looks like you produce a little bit of curvature even if you see a totally straight ball. So this suggests that really robust visual information isn't enough to influence listeners. Instead, not so robust visual information that's synchronized is enough. So synchrony seems to be the key ingredient. But uh, could it not just be possible that they're hedging their bets between low and high? Well, I mean, they don't really have a, one listener only saw one condition, so they don't really, right, they can't really integrate across. So, I think I'll go really quickly through the next study because I'm almost out of time and I want to leave plenty of time for discussion. I'm sure you guys are full of great ideas for me. Um, as a second way of investigating synchrony, we wanted to look at how close these speech and gesture have to come for them to engage this integration mechanism, right? Does speech and gesture have to be perfectly synchronized as they're, as they're naturally produced? If we shift them a little bit, do we still get the same effect? And so what we did in this case is using the video, we manipulated where the gesture occurred relative to when it naturally occurred. So sometimes the gesture came first, sometimes the gesture was a little bit delayed. And so far we've done this in a half second and a one second shift in both directions with the video coming before the speech it should have came with or the video coming after the speech it should have came with. So. Ah. The computer is getting slow. There we go. <laughs> Good thing I'm almost to the end. What I have here are the results. Um, all of these, well, not all of these, but the green is different than the blue and the olive, which is different than the magenta and the red. Um, this is because we have a lot of participants. This is a subtle manipulation, and so we expect a subtle effect. What you see is that the green is the no shift. So listeners get the most information from gesture when it's perfectly timed with speech. If we go a half second, we already see less information, that's the blue and the olive, and we seem to see a greater decrement when the gesture comes late. So the gesture coming ahead of speech is a little bit more informative than the gesture coming after speech. And we see that same pattern again when we shifted a second away, but a second, we're really substantially decreasing the information that listeners are getting. So it looks like really perfect synchrony is what matters. Gesture can anticipate speech, and we see slightly less disruption than when gesture follows speech. But even with just a half a second of delay, we already see differences in listeners' response to gesture. And of course, now we're narrowing in. What about a quarter second? And we'll keep going to kind of see where this trade-off occurs. I don't expect it to have to be zero shift, um, but I think probably in that quarter of a second range, which is consistent with what's, how speech and gesture are naturally produced. So um, what I would argue is that these results, all taken together, suggest that listeners are really sensitive to the synchrony of information across modalities. What gestures are for listeners is a perfectly synchronized visual signal that comes along with speech. Of course, I think it's pretty unlikely that speakers could generate anything else as perfectly synchronized as their hands, and that's the extent to which gestures are embodied. We also saw that listeners extract bodily information from those gestures. And so they're using gestures to, get, to guide their own bodies. And that's true even when the information isn't coming in in a bodily form. So if we look at speech and gesture, what I hope I've convinced you of is that they're a complementary tools for encoding information that are flexibly employed by speakers, that they adjust to their listeners, and that listeners perceive them as a function of the synchrony between these two modalities. So if we go back to what is embodied cognition, we think about this in the communicative domain, I think gesture is a perfect example of how we bring our bodies into communication in order to situate our language. So to create language in a particular context, 
we do so, timing matters. The exact time of the gesture matters relative to the speech. We're incorporating the environment into, the cognition, into our communication. When we point at things, that changes our speech. And we're using it to guide action. Our listeners are extracting information about how to act in the world as a function of the gestures that they see. And of course, offline cognition is bodily based. So are using that information even when it doesn't look bodily in how it comes in. So to conclude, I'll just make two broad points that I hope I've at least partially convinced you of, although I think you know, there's more work to be done. That's first of all that gesture has important impact on both speakers and listeners, both in the moment in which it's produced and in what happens over time. And I would argue that this suggests that communication really is embodied. It's fun to think of ourselves as abstract symbol machines that transmit this you know, totally disembodied information, but that's not what we do. We act in real space and time. We bring our hands and bodies into communication, and it matters. It influences both how we say what we say and what our listener perceives. So thank you very much for listening. I want to acknowledge my funding agencies, uh, NSF and Institute for Education Sciences, as well as the Delta Center at the U University of Iowa. And I want to highlight a couple of people. Katie Hilliard, who's a graduate student and who did both the safety study and the gesture for the listener Tower of Hanoi study. So she has a couple of uh, really nice studies there and some people in the lab who did this work, although some more people should be on the list. And I also want to acknowledge my family. So my husband might be up right now with our infant twins. Hopefully they're all sleeping soundly. I don't have a clue, and, but they did a lot of work so I could be here today. in terms of the idea that if I have this perceptual motor experience and I want to communicate it, I'm going to use gesture. But I also have some work that really just looks at the speakers that wasn't in this talk, in part because it's older work. And it really shows that when I gesture, that facilitates my in-the-moment cognition. I kind of um, free up cognitive resources for communication. And so you're right, that wasn't there, although I think the data are quite clear, and I'm happy to talk about that at length if you'd like. I would like to thank you for your interesting uh, presentation. Uh, my uh, understanding is that uh, you consider uh, the existence of two situations. Are there either the existence of gestures or the absence? Uh, you, did not, uh, you did not consider different types of gestures. Now, I would like to, as a computer scientist, uh, uh, have you thought about different representations of gestures and uh, uh, he considered the effect of uh, different types of gestures also. Thank you. Thank you. So great question. Um, I think there's a little bit of kind of type information so in terms of where the gestures are matters and it's not always gesture versus no gesture but I think you're right most of the data here really is gesture versus the lack of gesture and part of that is to lay the framework for looking at gesture in a more fine-grained way which is a lot of work that we're doing right now in, in my lab so with the avatar we're explicitly varying different types of gesture and looking at influences on learning. So to speak a little bit more broadly, we do know that gestures come in different types. So pointing gestures feel different than gestures that represent objects versus the gestures that I produce when I'm talking about quantum physics that feel very abstract. And I expect that those gestures all work a little bit differently. 
but I don't have a lot of real good data on that yet. It's hard to do. It's part, uh, part of what makes it really hard to do is people produce different types of gestures with different types of speech, and so you get all these confounds and they get hard to compare, but we're working hard on that question, so maybe in a few years I'll have something satisfying for you. But yeah, my computer scientist collaborators also really want that data. They're like, what's, what's the difference? And I'm like, I'm sorry, I, I really can't say anything yet. Uh, um, uh, you say that uh, just to uh, carry complementary information, uh, and you also said at the very beginning of the talk that uh, words uh, are reliable because you can talk and uh, carry information over the phone. Uh, uh, this uh, that's from the second one, but if you know the language. Uh, so don't you think that uh, gesture and body gesture actually come uh, also in the evolution of? of uh, so actually, it's uh, uh, talking, if you know the convention, which is complementary mm -hmm. to the body gesture. Yeah, I'm perfectly comfortable with that view. Um, I'm not sure I've seen any data that convinces me that that's true, but it, I think you're right that gesture in some way may be a little bit more primitive. At the very least, if we want to communicate to someone who doesn't have our shared language, we can use our bodies and do so quite effectively. I didn't talk about it, but in the Tower of Hanoi, if we just give people the videos, they know the experience and they can get information from just the video with no speech. If we just give them the speech, they don't know anything about the perceptual motor experience. I, I did mention that. And so I think this idea that kind of this bodily representation is already shared, right? It's shared from the beginning. We all have similar bodies. They're not quite the same, but they're kind of pretty much the same. And so there's an advantage there. I think you're right. But I also do think that we need this more abstract categorical representation, right? We're not always talking about the here and now. We're not always talking about specifics. A lot of our conversation is about the here and now and about specific that water bottle, not water bottles in general, but not all of it. And so words serve their function too. Uh, is to compare the protocol in speech. Mm -hmm. um, and I was wondering if I can do some of your presentations of the results, for example, when you're talking about radios of effects, you were saying that speech you don't change. So did you, or do you have studies where you did a control for, for speech protocol, or actually look at whether um, protocol changes which might be either not complementary, but might co-occur with changes in yep. the gestures? So in most of these studies, we're using the exact same, the prosody is exactly the same. In some cases, I think you're right, that prosody could be a carry of information. Um, we're looking at that more explicitly in the Tower of Hanoi right now, although I can't say for sure that it's not there in the prosody. Although, if you just hear the speech, you don't know that, but it still could be there a little bit. So, I think, yeah. Yep, yep, uh-huh, yep, and we're doing that. But yeah, and I think prosody is, I mean, we do use our vocal channel in gestury ways. And uh, my friend Hadash Shintel has a really elegant study where when we're communicating ab about a dot moving quickly, we talk faster and our listener uses that information to recognize the quickly moving dot. So I don't think the hands are the only thing that can do this sort of iconic representation. I think the voice can too and prosody is part of that. I have a question which is uh, a practical matter for teaching. I mean, uh -huh. Now it's uh, very personal to have a, a recording, a video recording of the teacher. So uh, my question is, uh, first, uh, is there a clear measure of uh, how the information is received by the student when there is a live uh, professor versus something recorded? And, uh, uh, also, something which uh, also um, is interesting looking at you here and looking at you over there <laughs> is that uh, these uh, video recordings sometimes uh, you have the teacher just uh, talking to the camera and gesturing to the camera, so it's uh, the student receives the information as uh, if the professor was talking to them. And then we have like uh, the classroom uh, and the video and uh, well, the teacher is uh, just teaching and uh, not caring about the camera. And uh, I found that this last uh, version, the other version, like uh, the classroom recording, is not very efficient. And 
She's also directing your attention off into Never Never Land. <laughs> yep. So I don't know of any real good research looking at this in the classroom context, so video versus an orientation. I think that would be a great study, and I'd love to start designing that study, I mean, especially given all the online uh, movement in education. I'm sure you guys have that here, but in the US, there's a lot of a move towards more online learning, and also these flipped classrooms where teachers or students watch lecture offline and discuss in classroom. And those are important issues for how to design that material. I do know, so in the gesture world, in general, we see the same effects with video as live, but in our lab, we have a really nice example where live matters, and that's this gesture location effect. So the high gestures, um, listeners get more information from the high gestures compared to the low gestures, but that's only true live. If you present them on video, they get the exact same information from both, and I think the explanation is we need to do the eye tracking study, but live, you look at my face, all of a sudden that matters. When you watch a video, you don't have to look at the person's face because they're not going to react to that. You then can look at their hands even when they produce their gestures down low and you get that same information from the gesture. So I do think there is a difference between live and video. It's probably often subtle um, and to the extent that the gestures were produced in a big space and you're watching them in a small space, that's probably going to matter. And to the extent that the speaker is directly engaging you, that's going to change whether or not you directly attend to those gestures or not. And I mean, in the normal way of processing gesture, we don't go around and look at people's hands all the time. We process gesture kind of in the periphery. And the same actually is true with sign language. Signers look at the faces of the person they're talking to and they process the signs in the periphery. And so we don't have to look at gestures to get information. When we look directly at them too much, that may change how information flows. And speakers probably aren't expecting or aren't used to producing speech that's designed for the gestures to be the main carrier, right? So when you're kind of producing, talking to a video, you don't expect that your gestures are even more informative, even though they might be in that case. Did that answer your question? There was a lot in there, but yeah. Thank you for that question. So, this really is on the same sort of track, like, to do with your study on session where you use the ball. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to know that you've done a similar thing with the gesture, the video gesture, the live gesture, but no speech position. So the, so, so, so the so, just speech. No speech. So we've, we haven't done that in terms of from that, how do you move? We've only done that in terms of from that, can you guess whether or not the speaker used real objects or the computer? So if you just get the gesture, you can guess. You can say that was a real object speaker, that was a computer speaker. But I think you're right, and especially given what we see with the balls. It would be interesting to just look at the gesture and see how that affects your movement. So do you need synchrony with speech? Or if you watch my hands move, is that enough to engage us? That's a great question. No. Yeah, great question. Thank you. I was just, just thinking while we were talking about gestures about the classically famous Bond girl and the, you know, the one with the German accent uh, who was really not, uh, not using any gestures at all. <laughs> just thinking there, motionless and just moving his lips, and then uh, you know, obviously on the trap door to open, and then they get famous for us and they get in his neck. And um, so, so, do you think that, that, uh, that the more is better for this discussion? Um. Very often. Especially in business situations and um, you know, in the men's and women's room, you don't know that at, um, at all, and communication is very, very um, efficient in these situations. So, therefore, um, what's your take on that? So I do think that there is a trade-off in terms of as you dampen down your gesture, you end up having to put more in speech, like we saw with this pointing gesture, and you're probably making it harder for yourself 
based on data that I didn't present, um, because you're putting all the information in one channel. But I think you can do that fairly effectively. I mean, you can get a lot of information in speech. You might miss some of the little things that would have come out in gesture. But there are kind of discourse situations where it's awkward to gesture. I do think that often we think people aren't gesturing when actually they are, because you know, when I'm talking, you become aware of gesture. But when a normal person is talking and moving their hands, we don't really notice it. We only notice it when they stop talking and need to find a word, or they're doing really large things. And so, well, I, I'm, 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 you know, not, I'm not blaming the creator of uh, um, uh, this is, um, the, the cartoon series, uh, uh, but he gestures quite a lot. So if you're listening, uh, if you're watching him, it's absolutely unknown. Mm -hmm. uh, and it's and it's a massive structure. And, uh, but is that watching him live or on a little video where it's? Room? I just him off his ear. I think that may be true, although I don't have any empirical evidence for that. I do think, however, that when our attention gets drawn to gesture, we think that it's distracting, even though it may go back and be helping us in those moments. We may experience it as distracting, and that's kind of like the listeners in the ball video who said that they thought these balls were distracting. They didn't have anything else to pay attention to, and they didn't like them, but they did give them the information that they needed. And so there may be a disconnect between, whoa, you know, that feels crazy, but it may actually, it's coming in, the timing is right, it may actually still be helping us at a different level, even though we're having a subjective experience that maybe isn't quite as pleasant as gestures that are more um, produced a little bit more in the normal range. And there is cultural variation. Europe has been studied fairly extensively. Northern Europeans do gesture in smaller spaces, but it's not the case that they don't gesture at all. So. My question is actually related to what you said okay. last. Uh, I wonder um, to what extent uh, the amount of information conveyed and the way it is conveyed is uh, varies over different cultures and uh, languages. And whether this may also be related to some particular features of the language at what point I gesture or how I gesture. Um, I think that's a question that we don't have a lot of answers to. Um, I do think that some cultures have a lot of emblematic gestures, so like thumbs up, which is basically like a word, right? It's codified, we have to produce it the right way, and you have to learn it, you don't just automatically produce and perceive it. Some, gesture, some cultures have a lot of those, like Italians have hundreds of those, and as soon as you start to use those a lot, you increase awareness of this channel, you're using this channel in overt ways, and that may influence the less aware use of this channel, um, but there's not a lot of good data on that. Um, there's also, there is also this change in size that you see, so some cultures gesture with large space and in other people's personal space. Other cultures make that space bubble a lot smaller. The gestures are a lot smaller. Um, what that does in the moment for thinking, learning, communicating, we don't know yet. I think that it will be interesting to find out. Okay. Um, yep. uh, just to, to take on Ron's point, uh, the room that we uh, gesture for ourselves, the speaker is part of the, the, the way plants for the speak is that we can uh, stop gesturing when we are uh, talking on the phone. Yeah. That's very fun yeah. there. Yeah. yeah, well, especially with cell phones, you know, I love it nowadays. You get to watch crazy people all the time, and then you realize, oh, they're just talking. That's normal behavior, right? Whereas... Let me suggest some of the possible functions for gesturing, communicative functions, which are beyond the referential information that we yeah. need to know just like uh, information about exp expressive information mm -hmm. about the emotional state in being. And also information about that helps parsing the, the sentences, mm -hmm. which is a more specific sort yep. of function that may be very relevant, at least for this audience, yep. because the language parsing is quite uh, yep. an issue. Well, and gestures do mark, they come along with clauses, they don't cross these higher order grammatical boundaries. I think the safety study really shows, I mean, 
independent of the meaning carried by those gestures, just when I produce a gesture is informative. If I think what I'm saying is important, that's when I gesture. You could gesture at various points in the utterance, but we gesture at the most informative points, and that can be a cue for how to parse and how to adjust your attention across that utterance. And I'm really interested in that question. Because we just gesture when we start to talk. Yep. So we are marking the initial definition of a random phrase. Yep. Mm-hmm. And if you look at sequences of discourse, what you see is that as sentences unfold, the gestures come with the new information. So they really mark what is the contribution of this sentence. Then the next sentence, what's the essence of that sentence? The gesture comes along with the key kind of material carrier. We don't gesture with little little bitty function words or with old information and so I think they also mark the structure of what we're saying at a higher level and that's independent of the actual content which also goes along with kind of that. And then they also explain why we can get the information even with the the details of the question are just in writing. Yep and I think yesterday we had And I think this timing really matters. Yep, even if you have something like maybe a pulsing thing that marks when a gesture occurred, I think that would be somewhat useful. You wouldn't get all the information, but just saying this is important, this is, you know, that would I think that would be useful for listeners. Even the details of the gesture are different. Yep, completely. So it's coordinating the line. First question. Uh, so, you used to use frequently with the detecting of the, the mouse to yep. have a very fine grained measure. Uh, in that setting, you didn't really talk about how the performance of the task itself is affected by that. Yep. Well, you pointed to this example of the teaching. Yep. Uh, and following a general assessment, you know, the people think, yeah, there's some role that's like a very really minor role. Mm-hmm. Just to give us some sense of how. Yep. How, how that is. Yep. So, and the Tower of Hanoi is a tricky task because if you make one wrong move, then all of a sudden you go and you have to make tons of moves to correct yourself. So, measuring performance is highly noisy. And this gesture effect is really robust. I mean, the first study was six per speakers in each condition. And, I mean, you don't need a lot of data for this. And so the performance is just too noisy. It's not difference between, different between conditions. And we don't necessarily expect it to be. Some speakers give better explanations than worse. So in that study, we don't have, we're not kind of not interested in this. But I have a whole other line of work that looks at gesture in math learning and really shows how kids who see gesture and who gesture learn more and they remember more 24 hours later and three weeks later. And some of the effects are quite large, like remembering twice as much um, 24 hours later after gesturing versus, or seeing gesture versus not. It varies a little bit by domain and type of gesture and all that hasn't been perfectly worked out. Um, I do think gesture might be particularly important in these teaching domains where I'm trying to communicate a real new concept to you. Right? If I'm telling you about how to get from, I don't know, my house to the supermarket, I use gesture and it's informative, but I'm also going to use words that you know, you know about moving in the environment. When I'm a child learning, say, a new math concept, I have to construct some totally new understanding, and that's hard. That's really hard with words, and I think gesture might have particularly powerful effects in supporting new conceptual understanding. So in these learning domains where the speaker is not just conveying information that you already know how to process, but is in fact conveying a new concept that you have to kind of unpack and, and get. So. Okay, please thank our speaker and support.